Hello and welcome to Good Game, the show for gamers by gamers. I'm Bajo. And I'm Junglus. This week, gaming's ultimate naughty boy Kratos gets let off his chain in the latest God of War game for PSP. We visit the company that makes the game the armed forces use to train their personnel. And squad-based urban tactics are the focus of Tom Clancy's latest game, Rainbow Six Vegas 2. Lux looks at the skill shortage affecting many Aussie game development companies who are finding it hard to attract and keep staff with the right skills. But first, can you guess the game for this week? And believe it or not, there is a link between this game and Kratos. But first, the news. That's madness. Madness? This is Newsworthy! <sighs> Pathetic. Good game. Super Smash Bros. Brawl has become Nintendo's fastest selling game ever, after clocking up massive sales in its first week of release in the USA. The mascot mashup sold 1.4 million copies in just one week. A tally that means the game sold more than 120 copies for every minute for every day of its first week on sale. Super Smash Bros. Brawl still does not have a confirmed release date for Australia. Guitar manufacturer Gibson are claiming that Activision's Guitar Hero franchise is an infringement on one of their patents, an accusation that has caused Activision to take legal action. According to Gibson, Guitar Hero infringes on a 1999 patent the company filed for technology used to simulate a musical performance, and they have requested Activision pay licensing fees for the use of the patented technology. In return, Activision have filed a lawsuit asking the American courts to find Gibson's claims invalid. Until now, Gibson have been an active partner in the Guitar Hero games, licensing their guitar designs to Activision for use both in the game and for the design of the game's guitar peripherals. In competitive gaming news, the world's cyber games have announced their official lineup for 2008, with some notable choices. Counter-Strike 1.6 was again picked over Source, and the more technical Virtua Fighter 5 over the flashier Dead or Alive 4. Project Gotham Racing 4 won over Forza 2, and Halo 3 will replace Gears of War, which happens to be banned in this year's host country, Germany. Finally, the Cyber Athlete Professional League in the U.S. have suspended all activities, ending a 10-year reign in U.S. esports competitions. Citing the current economic climate, the fragmentation of the sport, and a crowded field of competing leagues as reasons. The CPL still plans to pay out all prize money for 2007 winners. Team Rainbow recently discovered that casinos and convention centers of Las Vegas were the perfect setting for many a grand old shootout. It's also the perfect setting for Ubisoft dynamic in-game advertising, so it's no surprise that Tom Clancy decided to extend his holiday in Rainbow Six Vegas 2. Your squad is the best there is, and you'll be leading them all around Las Vegas as you infiltrate hideouts, take out baddies, and defuse chemical weapon bombs. The replay value comes in the popular multiplayer, and the playtime comes from its difficulty, as it's not uncommon for just one bullet to put you out of commission. Most of your time will be spent breaching rooms, which becomes a breeze with all your high techery. Along with the standard flashbang fare, snake cams and thermal vision provide an advantage. A thermal overscan will allow you to see where all nearby enemies are, and well-placed charges behind doors will disable anyone on the other side. This is pretty much what you'll be doing the whole game. Often you're presented with two or three entry points to flank with. A quick, clean breach requires planning and can be a lot of fun. Breach clear. I can charge. After the breach, you'll progress through hallways and rooms, triggering more enemies that attack you from all sides. You do this until you reach the next closed door. Now that's pretty much the single player in a nutshell, and if it sounds like doing the same thing over and over again, it is. I never got bored of it though, and as the breaches got more complex, I enjoyed it more. However, I never played the first Vegas, so I'd be interested to hear what you think, Badge, because uh, you were a pretty big fan of that, weren't you? I was, yeah, and, and this one holds my interest all the way through to the end, but that doesn't mean it couldn't have had more imaginative level design. It doesn't take long to get the routine down, but it's a fun routine. Abseiling down for a window entry is great, but there's not much new in number two, which makes me a little worried about the multiplayer. Explain. 
Well, out of the Tom Clancy games, Vegas is the most popular for multiplayer, and when you release a sequel, it forces the community to choose and can sometimes split the community. But considering there's not really that much new in number two, couldn't it just mean backwards compatible? Yeah, good point. And Ubisoft's been pushing Vegas as their competitive esports title, so it's a bit odd they'd shoot themselves in the foot like that. Four-player co-op has been scaled down to two players as well, but the AI of the teammates is much better. What are your final thoughts then, sir? Well, for some it may feel like an expansion, and maybe rightfully so. Explosions still look pretty cheap, and in non-HD the frame rate slows down a lot, which is something that you should really fix with a sequel. I'm giving it 7 out of 10 rubber chickens. Halfway through the second level, I realized I was doing the same thing over and over. Halfway through the third, I realized I didn't care. I don't even want to use the word repetitive because I had fun the whole way through. I'm giving it 7.5 out of 10 rubber chickens. Rainbow Six Vegas 2 comes out for PC, PS3, and 360 in a few days. We reviewed the 360 version. Not, but local game development is experiencing a major skills shortage crisis and has been for some time. Understaffed Australian companies are having to cap growth and some developers have even had to knock back work. So why can't the industry keep up? The video game industry in Australia is growing very rapidly at present. There are more than 2,000 people employed in game development studios here in Australia. And we're definitely looked upon uh, increasingly globally as a great place to make video games. And what that means is that all Australian studios are desperately looking for uh, more able talent. And yeah, at present, there is a skills shortage. Where are all these workers? Uh, they're out there. They're graduating from the from the universities and the TAFEs and the, uh, the specialised courses that are out there. But uh, they're coming out with skills that might not perhaps be relevant to what we're looking for. Technology in the games industry moves faster than supersonic. Often new graduates find themselves skilled in programs that are outdated and not that useful. But that doesn't mean that getting a uni degree or doing a TAFE course is a waste of time. I've been in the workforce now for about six years and I just decided that you got to do what you love and because I'm really into computer games and that sort of thing, um, I decided to come back and do a games degree and sort of see where it leads me in the industry. I looked at a number of different courses and a lot of what I found was that it was either programming or art. I'm sort of waiting until my second year to decide sort of what specifically I want to go into, um, but I'm hoping, you know, as I go through that that clicks. Very few employees in the games industry don't have a degree. There are Occasionally you come across somebody who doesn't have tertiary qualifications, but it's not like the old days where, you know, it was a couple of geeks sitting around eating pizza, playing games, saying, hey, wouldn't it be a great idea if we made X, Y, Z? It's not like that anymore. It's much bigger than that. And most uh, employers are looking for somebody who has a degree in a sort of a generic computer science type area. But I think what's really important is not that we should be teaching specific languages because specific languages will always change. What students need to learn is conceptual stuff. They need to learn about the concept of programming um, and what the games industry are looking for are those really brilliant, gifted programmers who can turn their hand to any language. How important is a mentoring scheme and internships for attracting and training future employees? As the games industry in Australia grows up, and remember we're still a very young industry, we're realising that we need to do more in terms of mentoring, more in terms of uh, internships. When you come to work at a games company, you're not going to be able to immediately hit the ground running. You're going to need someone more senior, more experienced to uh, help you along and, uh, and show you the ropes. Many professionals in the industry find the workload too much and the pay too little. Many change industry and others head overseas. So what can be done to retain these workers and improve conditions? I think the industry has to make sure that they retain their staff and, uh, and make sure that they give their staff a good lifestyle. Um, we don't want to lose that experience. We also need to encourage more people from other industries into the games industry. Um, really kind of turn it into a, a professional science of how to create these, these products because there's a lot of stronger methodologies in other industries. What we have to do is to stop people thinking that the games industry is just um, a joke, which is 
what parents think when their year 12 student says, Mum, I want to do a games degree. Mum has a heart attack. It's, why do you want to do a games degree? There's no money in that. There's not a career in that. There's no future in that. Well, to all the mums and dads out there, there is. It's a huge industry. What advice would you give to people who aspire to work in the games industry in Australia? One of the first guys that we hired here at Taurus um, basically turned up and said, I just want to work for free, I just want to work in the industry. And uh, I think he was here a month before everybody felt guilty about not giving him a paycheck and, <laughs> and ended up giving him a paycheck yeah. because he just created his own job essentially. But that was his, he was his passion. So. Know, more practice, get in touch with people and, and try and understand the industry that you're coming into. In the end, I realised that, you know, you, you work for so long in your life that if you're not doing something that you love, then what's the point? Um, so I thought, well, it's better to, to go back to uni now while I'm sort of still young, um, get the degree done and then go down the field that, that I love and hopefully that'll pay off. Well, let's hope we can help the situation by giving two people a start in the games development industry. As part of the Good Game Game project, two mentorships are up for grabs where you can work alongside the pro developer on the game we're making together. Entries for the ideas phase close next week, so if you're sitting on an idea for a great game, get off your dates and submit the entry. All the details on how to do so are on our website. And now, over to you, Richard and Gamer Tonight. Musical games have taken over consoles around the world. These games push your limits in both coordination and stamina, be it either dancing up a storm or jamming out a solo on a plastic guitar. Joining me now is Rob Harley, and when it comes to musical games, he's one of the best. The best. Now tell me, how did you get involved in this genre? Involved? Nah, man. You are born with the gift. Really? What gift? I can move my fingers like lightning one. Let's, Let's make, make good, good music. music! Yeah! Let's go! Good! 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 Rockstar! And my feet? Stomp like thunder. Ring time! Right! Awesome! Hey! Perfect! Whoa, amazing! But doesn't this kind of gaming wear out your stamina? Yeah, but I have ways of cooling off. Whew, yeah, man, that is the stuff. Sir, please get off the air hockey table. It's the third time this week. Oh, pfft, like anyone plays this game anyway. Truly, truly amazing, Rob. How about giving us... A live performance. Sure, mon. Here's a combo that will knock your socks off. Boom to bum to boom to bum 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 to but what about a game that helps people avoid losing an eye, a leg, or even their life? Somewhere on the east coast of Australia, a company is using a virtual simulation to do just that. They call it Virtual Battle Space, or VBS2. So tell us, what do you do here? We uh, take computer games and modify them for serious use, be it uh, the military or first responders like police and ambulance. We started uh, several years ago now with a commercial computer game called Operation Flashpoint. Um, that was, uh, was stole, sold in stores, I think it was Game of the Year in 2001, and we've added on layers of functionality to make it more suitable for military use. Uh, these layers of functionality include after action review, so once the, the military users play through a scenario they can watch what happened to, uh, to, to, to work out if they did the right thing or the wrong thing. We added 
uh, what's called HLA and disk compliance. This is the ability for VBS, or the computer game, to talk to other military simulations. We also added uh, real-time editing functions. So the instructor in real-time could do things like drop in an improvised explosive device, um, change the nature of the scenario without having to stop the scenario, and then restart the scenario. You want a contract to develop loadmaster systems for the Australian Army. How does it all work, the virtual reality side sure. of things? Well, what you're seeing here is a, a modification of our, of our desktop training software. So this is the Loadmaster Virtual Reality Trainer, also known as the Air Crewman Virtual Reality Trainer. And what Air Crew, Crewmen do, they actually instruct the pilot uh, how to fly the helicopter when they're going slow and low. So Gordon here is immersed in virtual reality. He's wearing a virtual reality headset, and through that headset, he actually sees the virtual environment. But everything that happens here, the gun movement and his head movement, that's all uh, tracked in 3D. It's multiplayer as well. Can soldiers actually train with other soldiers at the same time? Absolutely. So it's, it's a multiplayer game. You can have some infantry in there, so some, some soldiers. You can have some crew, maybe manning uh, armoured vehicles, like a, a tank or an armoured personnel carrier. You can have pilots flying aircraft, 50 or 100 soldiers sitting down, one at each computer, more or less playing together to, to get, achieve some training outcome. So, Peter, can I have a go? Certainly. If you could give me one piece of advice before I start, what would it be? Hold on. Hold on? Let's <laughs> <Okay>. go. <laughs> Let's get immersed. <clears throat> oh, well, that's disorientating. <laughs> so you're now in the aircraft. If you look to the left, you'll see the pilots. They're ignoring me. <laughs> I'm going to shoot this barn for no apparent reason. Take that. Which countries use VBS2 for training? At the moment, either the, the Australian Defence Force, the US Marine Corps, or the United Kingdom Ministry of Defence. So it's more or less a, a worldwide operation. This is pretty hard. Yeah, well, that's, <laughs> that's why they need to train on it. Okay. So you're shooting uh, people on the ground from a moving helicopter. Is that guy on my side? None of the guys are on your side. None of the guys are on my <laughs> side? All right, that's all the information I needed. <laughs> Let's go. They're going to go into Iraq, for example. They might ask us to build Baghdad. Uh, we'll create Baghdad virtually, and then they'll go and do their, their mission rehearsal within the game before they actually deploy in theatre. And how close is it to actual Baghdad, what, what you modelled here? We call it geospecific. For something like Baghdad Green Zone, which was a, about a 16 kilometre square uh, terrain area, the roads and the rivers are in the right place. We're using satellite texture to map, uh, to texture the terrain with. We might go down to individual buildings, so we'll do, for example, the Australian Embassy or Saddam's Palace if we're talking about Baghdad. Um, so, so fairly, fairly specific level of detail. At the end of the day, this happens in a very closed, clean and safe environment. How could this ever compare with firing a rocket at a, an actual Taliban insurgent, for example? Well, the short answer is it just simply doesn't. And I mean, the key, the key thing here is we're not trying to augment um, live training. So the soldiers still need to go out to, into the field and shoot their, their rifles, for example. But what we, what we offer is uh, a way to supplement their training, train them up in doing the correct procedures. So when, when it becomes that stressful situation in the field or actually in theatre, maybe they're going to react a little bit quicker than what they would have without that simulated training. Simulated training at the moment, it's not as realistic as real life but we're working on it. I, I think I'm on fire. Yeah, I'm on fire. I definitely. think you're in a bit of trouble. <laughs> I think your helicopter's about to explode. <laughs> oh, I'm down. <laughs> oh, that was a perfect opportunity for me to say it. Ah, uh, junglers, you know I crashed deliberately just to foil your plan. Mm. Get you the trooper. Pathetic. If there's one thing that God of War's Kratos is best known for, it would probably be his tendency to tear off the limbs of Greek gods and beat them with the weddings. But if there are two things that he was known for, the other would be Quick Time Events. The Quick Time Event, or QTE for short, is a game design device used to make cinematic sequences more interactive. During a cutscene, button icons appear in rapid succession. And if you hit the corresponding button, you'll either win or lose the event changing the course of the animated sequence. Quick time events were first used in Dragon's Lair in 1983. Created by former Disney animator Don Bluth, Dragon's Lair ran on early Laserdisc technology, and it looked incredible for its time. Lead on, adventurer. Your quest awaits. It was essentially one big quick time event. The player had to press directions and buttons with perfect timing to survive. But since the game didn't give you any clues as to what you had to press next, it got frustrating long before you got to rescue the kidnapped Princess Daphne. 
Dragon's Lair was followed by a string of similar games, including another Don Bluth creation, Space Ace. But it wasn't until 1999 that QuickTime events would really hit the big time. It was game designer Yu Suzuki's role-playing epic, Shenmue, that reinvented the QuickTime event. Shenmue featured QuickTime events for practically every occasion, from catching soccer balls to beating up some no-goodniks. It took the concept of interactive cinematics to its limit and inspired plenty of imitators, some that were good and some that were just dreadful. <laughs> Treyarch's Spider-Man 3, for example, was one of the most dismal attempts at QuickTime events we've ever seen, and games like Clive Barker's Jericho and Factor 5's Lair weren't much better. In these games, the button icons often appeared and disappeared way too fast, and if you fouled up once, they would return you right back to the start of the event. Thankfully, Sony's God of War series and Ninja Theory's Heavenly Sword managed to get QuickTime events right. The icons stick around long enough for you to see them. And if you miss one, you aren't always punished with a swift and frustrating death. Whether you love or hate them, though, QuickTime events aren't going to disappear quickly. Just be sure that you only hit the good ones and not the bad ones. Good game. Olympus needs you. I grow tired of the god's request, Athena. I have given enough. Now take these nightmares from my head. Kratos, the ghost of Sparta, is back, and this time you can take him on the bus. God of War Chains of Olympus is a prequel to the original PS2 game and sheds some light on the beginnings of Kratos as he slashes, <laughs> smashes, and headbashes his way through an epic plethora of ancient Greek villains. Who calls for the ferryman? You're thrown right into the action, and within moments you realize that not only is Chains of Olympus just awesome fun, but it's also a technical achievement for the PSP, especially as the PS2 games were made by a completely different developer. And if you've played a God of War before, you'll instantly be familiar with the way you fight, solve puzzles, and level up. There's new combos as well as old, and the best part about them is they're all useful. Yeah, Jung, for me it was the first game where I found that blocking was both fun and necessary. As in previous God of War games, different combos have different strengths and weaknesses, so it forces you to change your plan of attack as you go against different enemies. Some moves break shields, defensive abilities can repel projectiles, combos chain seamlessly together, dramatic camera angles and zooms let you enjoy close combat death scenes, and the use of quick time events are more creative than ever. Father! Father, no! Like other God of War games, the symbols get bigger as time runs out and incites panic. And like we said earlier in the show badge, some games get this right, some don't, and it makes a big difference. We didn't quite know what to make of the interactive sex scene. My lord? There's just so much polish here, and it really feels like the developers thought about every single section and said, how can we make this more interesting? Puzzle-specific animations also aren't reused just for the sake of it, and it's the best smoke, fire, and cloth effects we've seen on the PSP. Now that we've been playing God of War games for a while, we're starting to understand why this series is so much fun. Gameplay is perfectly broken up with puzzles, cutscenes, and lore to move you forward. And the only real criticism we had of the PS2 games was the camera tracking, where sometimes you couldn't see who you were fighting. But there's none of that here. Yeah, Jung, they have the formula for effort and reward down perfectly. Also, the parry system has been improved, and it reminded us a little bit of Heavenly Sword. Mm. When you're dealing out high range attacks, enemies actually back out of the way. And the combinations of enemies are also very intelligent, which is a lot more interesting than just giving them more hit points. You really feel like your hits are connecting, too. Often with PSP fighting games like uh, Ultimate Alliance or Justice League Heroes, you don't actually truly feel like you're hitting the enemy, and it's all a little nerfed. With Chains of Olympus, though, the quick time events, music triggers, plus the one-on-one -on -one encounters, all make it feel much more interactive and, consequently, more rewarding. I especially like the subtle rumble when you do the more powerful attacks. <laughs> Mm. 
And there's certain sounds that everyone makes when they're playing this game, isn't there, Ben? Yeah, I had lots of oohs and ahs coming from your desk this week, John. It's also one of those games where if you're playing it, you always want to bring more people over just to show them some of the cool stuff that's happening on the screen. <laughs> Yeah, it's really quite fun working out the tricks that the developers use to make this game run so smooth. First off, there's no loading. It all appears to be done while the cutscenes are going on, a way of force to do a slow action. This creates a kind of dynamic airlock which allows the game to load ahead of time. However, if we've learned anything from Monster Freedom Hunter 2, it's that background loading takes more power. And I don't know about you, John, but I found my battery life shortened by a couple of hours playing this game. Yeah, I saw your battery power run out during the final cutscene. I know, it was with that. Thankfully, it restarted when I plugged it back in the wall, but... There are some nice camera tricks to allow for such large draw distances. The camera slows right down to keep the frame rate up, and some clever use of 2D textures are there. But we found that the dialogue and the story wasn't of the same epic quality as the other God of War games. Yeah, Jung, it did feel a little cliched at times. All glory be to Lord Zeus for granting you safe passage to me. The king of the gods does not aid me, Eos. I am but a slave to Zeus and Olympus. Final thoughts? Well, if you're a Kratos veteran, you might actually blast through this in under six hours. But there is replay value, especially if you enjoy playing as a giant potato. I'm giving it nine and a half out of ten rubber chickens. You know, Jack, there's so many nerfed PS2 ports and PSP games with big brand titles that just don't do the series justice. So when a game comes along like this and really sets the bar so high, it's a good sign of things to come and it deserves a ten out of ten in my book. Good game. So, gamers, did you guess the game for this week? It was Mickey Mania, The Timeless Adventures of Mickey Mouse, released in 1994 on the Super Nintendo Entertainment System and the Sega Mega Drive. Even though the game had you control Mickey through levels based on classic Mickey Mouse cartoons, the game was criticized for being far too hard, especially for children. David Jaffe was the designer on Mickey Mania. Ten years later, of course, he was the creator and lead designer on the first God of War game. So, gamers, another episode of Good Game draws to a close. Next week, we'll be looking at younger gamers. Studies are showing they're starting to game as early as four, but is that too young? We'll be investigating the cost of games in Australia. We know we pay more than our friends in America and Europe, but why? History gets rewritten game style in Turning Point Fall of Liberty, which sees Nazis invading New York City in the new shooter for next-gen platforms. And have you ever felt left out while your friends bandy around extreme gamer terms like bloom effects and emergent gameplay? Or fret no longer, because these and other wanky terms shall be explained. Don't forget you're running out of time to get your entry into the Good Game Game Project, and all the details on how to enter are on our website. We'll also be on the forums after the show to chat. Until next week, gamers, Bajo out. Jungle's out. <laughs> <laughs>